So, no matter who you're designing a website for and what platform or device you're designing it for, there are actually some things that always hold true. We're talking about design and consistency. In order to have a nice looking layout, you gotta make sure things are designed properly and they're done consistently. So, how can you make this happen in Dreamweaver? Well, very simply, we're gonna go over those very things, but I can tell you right off the bat, it involves symmetry and using some of the tools that we're gonna to discuss to make that happen. White space is kind of tricky because a lot of times users wanna cover every nook and cranny of their web page. When in fact, you do wanna use white space properly because this can help contribute to the readability of your page. I can once again set up my default text color. I can set up that background color again. I can bring in a background image. The user's eye is usually drawn first to the top left grid intersection, then to the intersection below it, and then finally the user's eye will move to the top right and then bottom right cross sections. Okay, so even if you don't have a design background, well, as you can see, if you use these Dreamweaver tools that I just went over with you, and you just remember the real simple rule of symmetry and balance, consistency, you'll be good to go. The bone tool is used when we want to create an effect with something called an armature. This is when we take more than one movie clip, link them together so they work and move as one, like the joints in your arm, pieces of a machine, or links in a chain, creating some really cool effects. When I take my selection tool, you can see Flash is showing me where this armature goes. If I come up here and grab this point here and just start dragging, take a look at what's happening. What we have here is a defined set of joints and limbs that Flash can use to keep everything together like this. You can see that we're moving this whole tentacle element in one continuous thing, just like we're a natural arm or this tentacle of our blob monster. So. Here's our fancy stick figure superhero. We're gonna make him fly off into the air. You can see that our little stick man is flying away and staying up in the air for just a little bit. I think that's looking pretty good. So this would be one way, if you just want absolute total control over your animation, frame by frame animation is a good way to do that, but you really do need to take the time to make it look good to ensure that every single frame is exactly where it needs to be so you have a good animation project. Frame by frame animation can come at a cost of taking a little bit more time and can be a little more tedious like we've shown, but it offers you the greatest amount of control for making sure your objects look exactly how you want on stage. Now it's time to talk about how to navigate documents within Photoshop. I'll demonstrate how to rotate the canvas, how to pan and zoom so you can avoid using the scroll bars in your file, and overall simply how to work efficiently in Photoshop. Plus, we'll learn how to show and hide rulers, add and remove guides, and how to use guide properties. Let's get to work. Using your zoom tool, if you click and drag, it's gonna zoom in on the area that your cursor is located. Now I'm zooming in quite a large amount. You can see that I'm currently zoomed in to 3200%, more than you'd ever really need. But if you click again and you start dragging again, it's going to zoom out. Now the way this tool works is if you click and drag, I'm going to click and drag straight down, what I can do is I can rotate the angle of this photo to the angle that I like to work on. So for example, what we could do is you can click the Tile All Vertically button, and now it has basically split all of the images into their own individual windows. Maybe not the best view for this particular set of images. So if you go to the window menu, you can also go to arrange, and I'm gonna use the four up view. Now the four up view is a little more logical because the orientation or the aspect ratio of each image lends itself to this configuration. So if I click on one of these, I can use my hand tool to kinda of see what I'm looking at here, kinda of change what I'm viewing. I can click on this image to make it active and just change each one of these individually. Now that we have our cliffs in a premiere, well, the main thing we gotta do is cut them and organize them. So let's look at the source window, the source monitor, 
and figure out how we can cut them and get them ready and put together a pretty good rough cut. So with this, um, down below I have what looks like VCR controls where I can play and you know I can fine tune where I'm at. In this case, I need to scrub ahead. So I'm just gonna grab this, kind of scrub forward, you know, using different methods to monitor the video clip. I can play this, go back to our video. If I wanted to analyze the audio, see how my audio looks, I can also change that. The rough cut is a great foundation for our movie, but as I said before, it's not quite perfect. So now let's look at using the sequence and utilizing that to kind of arrange and fine tune our movie so that we really have a polished, edited final piece. There's a lot going on in the timeline in our sequence that I just kind of want to explain. So I'm going to expand this just a little bit. Okay, maybe a lot. But right here, we have multiple video tracks, and you'll notice that they get highlighted here. As I play this clip, um, when I have it highlighted, anything that I apply, let's say I want to apply a default transition or default effect, it'll apply to the highlighted track. Okay, so that is the trim monitor, and, it, and it's just really neat to be able to, to maneuver, to change how this goes. Once I leave this, it's adjusted everything right in here, so everything is just how I left it in the trim monitor. In this section, we're going to take a closer look at where we put our JavaScript within the HTML. There are actually three options. We can embed our JavaScript, we can attach our JavaScript, or we can put our JavaScript in the header of the document. I think one of these options is best, and I'll tell you why during the segment. We're also going to dig into the event-driven model of JavaScript. We're going to take a look at some of the different JavaScript events, and I'm going to show you how to use events to cause certain segments of JavaScript code to execute. In these 252 pages are all of the standards for appropriate JavaScript. Now, this is not a good reference for actually learning JavaScript, but it is a final and definitive answer to what exactly is correct JavaScript. For example, I pulled up page 94, and we see the information about assignment operators, which we'll look at later. So here I've put up some of the common JavaScript events. For example, we have onload and onunload, when the page loads or when the page unloads, and the page goes away, in other words. On focus and blur. You might have noticed when you fill out a form online, a certain field might have the focus. That's the field you're typing into. We can write JavaScript events for when a field gets the focus. I'm going to bring it up in the browser. I'm going to refresh, and there's the press me button. And that caused the JavaScript to execute which says you pressed the button. Let's look at the code one more time. In this section, we took a look at where to place your JavaScript code, looking at embedding it in actual HTML commands, putting it in the head and the body, and finally, attaching JavaScript, which I think is the most efficient way to write your JavaScript code. When creating web pages with HTML, one of the things you'll spend a lot of time doing is managing the text and image content of the page. In this section of the course, we're going to talk about just how to do that, managing all the different elements to mark up your content appropriately. We're going to talk about the classical HTML tags that have been part of the language since its inception, and then we're going to talk about the new tags that are part of the HTML5 spec. You don't want to use a word processor because a word processor sometimes embeds invisible characters in the code that might get misinterpreted by the browser. So you want to use a pure text editor. On the PC, a couple of examples are Notepad, which comes with every PC that runs Windows, Notepad++, which is free and downloadable, and Aptana, which is a robust development environment, which is also free and downloadable off the web. That's our basic document structure. So we start with our head, document head. That contains the title. Then our body contains all of the content that will appear in the browser window. Now, sometimes when I need content, I can go ahead and grab some from a great site that just generates Latin content for me. It's a lorem ipsum generator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this 
and I recommend you use it too. And I'm just going to grab one paragraph of Latin. It's dummy text, it's placeholder text, but since we're not doing a real site here, we're just kind of learning about HTML5, this is perfect to use. So we'll copy that into the P tag. And there we go.